Coming up next on West Side Stories, more details regarding the Michigan DEQ's probe into Viant Corporation following a community meeting. Plus, we take a look at the world of plastination and how this science field allows people to get up close and personal with once living creatures. And how one Grand Rapids organization is going the extra mile to help those that have been affected by cancer. All that and more next on West Side Stories. West Side Stories is produced by students from the Multimedia Journalism Program at Grand Valley State University. Support also comes from the School of Communications. Inspiring thought, perfecting practice. Welcome to West Side Stories. I'm Savannah Bressman. And I'm Mackenzie Sorrell. GVSU residents are still not sure what to expect next. After recent news that the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality is expanding its probe into possible cancer-causing emissions from Viant Corporation. The DEQ is planting more air quality sensors around the perimeter of the Viant site, hoping to get an idea of how far the emissions have spread from the plant. West Side Stories producer James Ford and I went downtown to visit the Viant site and to get an idea of the scope of the problem. Here's what we found. I'm here in downtown Grand Rapids right outside of Viant Medical where just four months ago dangerous amounts of cancer causing chemicals were found coming from the plant. People are concerned. If, when you hear about something like this, you start to wonder if maybe there's other things that I need to be more aware of and concerned about. State public officials held an open house at Grand Valley State University's Eberhard Center in early March. They had several presentations to discuss air quality and health concerns with the public. Chris Etheridge, Fields Operation Manager from Michigan Department of Environmental Quality, also known as the DEQ, says that the chemical found coming from the Viant plant is ethylene oxide. Recently, um, ethylene oxide was reclassified as a known human carcinogen. So based upon that information, Viant was identified as an emission source of concern. Etheridge says they first discovered the ethylene oxide emissions from a computer-generated analysis based on the emissions from the facility. The analysis is also able to predict concentrations of ethylene oxide throughout the Grand Rapids area. They couldn't believe what the results showed. They're one of the largest emitters of ethylene oxide in the state. After seeing that, we decided to collect some actual ambient air samples around the facility. Uh, so we used uh, SUMA canisters, which will collect for 24 hours ambient air. We put five SUMA canisters around the facility. And again, uh, based on the, the air samples, we found concentrations that were above acceptable human exposure limits. Etheridge says that the Viant situation is the number one priority of the DEQ right now. Viant is located in a populated area between a neighborhood and GVSU's Pew campus. Many other local businesses are located within blocks from Viant too. My building's right across the river from, from this location. So my employees are, are concerned. They want to know what's happening. You know, are they at risk? Um, is there something going on that we should be aware of? Is there some precautions that we should be taking? Businesses and locals are concerned Concerned. And Deb McKenzie Taylor from Michigan's Department of Health and Human Services says they have every right to be. The, the major concern for the levels that may be in the community is, is the cancer risk. Taylor says they have been working closely with DEQ to evaluate data related to the plant site during phase one of the investigation. We're waiting for DEQ to collect the phase two sampling, so we have an indication that there's higher levels on the plant site, but that doesn't tell us what the exposure is in the community. Etheridge says the phase two sampling will include 20 air sampling canisters. The canisters will be placed throughout the community, not just near the Viant facility. They hope to determine if there are other locations where ethylene oxide is above the acceptable human exposure limits. Depending on deploying the canisters the week of March 18th, the canisters themselves sample for 24 hours. So once we have those samples collected, it, it will take some time for lab analysis to occur. Taylor says that despite the results, they already know that they are most concerned about long-term exposure with the chemical. She says there is no short-term exposure threat to cancer development. It, it takes a long time for cancer to develop once you've been exposed. The types of cancer that we're concerned about with um, ethylene oxide are breast cancer and then cancers of the blood and limb system. So leukemia and 
and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and myeloma. Taylor says once they receive the lab analysis results in the next month, they will continue to work closely with the DEQ to protect the health of Grand Rapids residents. The DEQ will also continue to work with Viant Medical. The company's been cooperative with us. We've been working towards reducing emissions with them. Uh, but, you know, this is still kind of in the beginning stages of the investigation, and this will take time for us to resolve. Okay. The DEQ says that they will continue to keep the public updated with their findings throughout this investigation over the next few months. Reporting from Grand Rapids, I'm Mackenzie Sorrell. The Michigan Department of Public Health says they're working with the Kent County Health Department to start a Michigan Cancer Registry. The registry will include a list of everyone who has been diagnosed with cancer in Michigan since 1985. The list will include where they lived at their time of diagnosis. The Department of Public Health will then look at data in the area around Viant to look for trends of increased cancer. Thank you so much, Mackenzie, for that report. It seems that cancer is always in the news these days. But so are brave folks who fight cancer and who help those who are diagnosed with this deadly disease. In our next story, Madeline Crace looks at how local residents are supporting cancer patients right here in Grand Rapids. In downtown Grand Rapids, the American Cancer Society, or ACS, has a temporary home for cancer patients undergoing treatment. According to the cancer patient Karen Dupree, it's got a very good name. It's called Hope Lodge. The, having the Hope, Hope Lodge here to work with is, or to take care of us actually, they are fabulous here. The lodge itself is gorgeous and the staff is above reproach. Karen is undergoing cancer treatment in Grand Rapids and she and her husband say the lodge is making the process a little easier. Her treatments are five days a week for six and a half weeks so it would have been a lot of driving back and forth. The biggest barrier to having cancer is how much it costs. It just everything between insurance and hotel and it just costs a lot of money. So Hope Lodge is there to try to ease at least one of those burdens. Grand Valley's Colleges Against Cancer, or CAC, is helping to support the Hope Lodge through fundraisers. With CAC close and the medical mile within sight, Hope Lodge is in the perfect place. I think Grand Rapids is definitely um, a great place to be if you have cancer. We have an amazing team of doctors down here in Grand Rapids, whether you're an adult or a child. Organic is not only the current president of CAC, but a cancer survivor. She said that she has seen the benefits Hope Lodge can bring. Like my one friend came from Traverse City, um, and that is a long way to be driving back and forth every week to receive your treatment. So Hope Lodge gave them a place to stay um, during that time. We had the lodge here, um, so you can stay here free of charge. We do have um, the um, free transportation um, uh, to and from. Uh, the hospitals when you're receiving treatment. We also have a full setup kitchen and then we also have volunteers that come in and will cook community dinners um, throughout the week. The mission of Hope Lodge is to make visitors feel comfortable and gain a sense of community with other cancer patients. Hope Lodge also has game rooms, quiet living spaces, and libraries on every floor. For Alan, a cancer survivor and past CAC president, her involvement led her to fall in love with Hope Lodge. I've been working here the last two years, and ever since then, I've, I've, loved, I've loved it. I love what I do, and I, I really enjoy helping cancer patients and making a difference here, and the people, the other employees here are absolutely wonderful. CAC works the entire year participating in ACS fundraising and hosting Relay for Life on Grand Valley's campus. Funds support things like Hope Lodge. We get to put on community-wide events to help spread the word about cancer, and we get to um, kind of honor the people who have been affected by cancer, not only the survivors, but also the families who have gone through it. Thompson is co-chair of CAC Service and Survivorship, a community that supports the cancer community, including Hope Lodge. These people are going through something so traumatic and something that was it's really crazy to think about. You know what I mean? It's something that is I could never be able to think about doing. And being able to provide someone that reassurance that it's going to be okay, that I'm reaching out my hand and saying, I'm here with you and I'm going to help you go through this together. The efforts of Grand Valley CAC and others like it do not go unnoticed by the ACS. It's hugely important that CAC is involved because our CEO Gary Reedy always likes to say that this generation that I'm really fortunate to work with is going to be the generation that 
will not have to hear those words, you have cancer. And I truly, truly believe that. Karen Dupree says she's not just a fighter, she's a survivor. In Grand Rapids, I'm Madeline Crace. Colleges Against Cancer will be hosting their annual Relay for Life event on April 5th. At least half of the 10 fastest growing occupations will be in the healthcare fields, according to a prediction by the Federal Bureau of Labor Statistics. So it's no surprise that Grand Valley State University is promoting its allied health program. One way they're doing this is through an exhibit showcasing something called plastination. As reporter Chris Cooper shows us, it's a fascinating and slightly creepy look at the science of plastinating human and animal body parts. Turtles, fish, and humans? What do these all have in common? They've all been plastinated. You don't need gloves, they're, they're now turned into plastic. They are, you know, essentially here forever. Plastination is the process of turning organisms into plastic and is not only useful for preserving specimens, but also for learning. It helps the students who are dissecting, who are in the dissection process, because they have a, a specimen to look at that's been dissected to show things. And then it, it helps students that aren't dissecting, that are just studying to learn the material. You know, dissected specimens that are still wet and preservative, things aren't uh, they don't stand up by themselves, basically. So the, when you take them out of the preservative, their things are all flopped down and they're wet and everything else. Well, the plastinid specimens, we can, we can make things stand up and be separated from one another so students can see them more easily. The specimens can be dissected before being plastinated or can be plastinated whole. Once plastinated, they feel, well, like a plastic toy. So the plastinates are shelf stable, there's no chemical exposure to our students, you don't have to wear gloves with them, and we can plastinate kind of the best specimens. So a, a specimen that shows all the structures that we want to see, we can plastinate that and kind of have the, the beautiful, perfect specimen um, to use in class. Dr. Tim Strickler and Kim Weber run the plastination lab at Grand Valley State University. Strickler says that the process of plastinating a specimen usually takes around two to three months. So this is our acetone tank, so the specimens have to be dehydrated in acetone and they go through a process that can take several weeks sometimes to dehydrate them, remove all of the, the water from the tissue and replace it with acetone. We then put it into our vacuum chamber here and this is filled with liquid silicone and we hook up the vacuum chamber to our vacuum pump. It will gradually decrease the pressure so that the acetone um, comes out of the tissue and is replaced with the silicone. When the specimen comes out of the tank, it's going to be dripping in wet silicone. And we need to dry the specimen, make it hard and dry to the touch. So we use a, a type of chemical that we spray on it and it gradually hardens and cures the silicone. The specimens are dissected and plastinated by students at GVSU. However, the lab is not limited to the typical lab animals. Some of the ways they acquire these unique specimens may surprise you. The squids that are currently in our plastination exhibit here on campus were just bought at a local market in the frozen food section. <laughs> so anything can be plastinated. And Weber isn't joking when she says anything can be plastinated. This mythical looking creature is a two-headed calf. Strickler says it took three years to plastinate. While some may question why they chose to preserve this creepy calf forever, Strickler says it was worth the effort. There are a number, I've seen several around the country, taxidermy two-headed calves. They're interesting. They're, they look like calves with all their fur on and everything. You can't see anything that's inside of them. So the, one of the coolest things about our plastinated twin calves is you can see everything on the inside and you can see how it's different in the one as opposed to the other one. The calf is on display to check out in Kinchy Hall on GVSU's Allendale campus. If your stomach can handle it, that is. But perhaps even more weird is that the calf was donated to the lab by a farmer. Also on display on the Allendale campus are other, not so scary, specimens. We um, selected specimens that we wanted to have in the exhibition. So you can see here this lesser electric gray, this small nurse shark over here. Uh, we were looking for um, 
specimens too that would fit inside our exhibition case. So we were kind of limited in the size. A year we worked on it and then the exhibition has been up now for a year, or will be up for a year total. Um, the first half of the year it was downtown at the Pew campus and then the second half of the year it's here on the Allendale campus. The Plast Nation exhibit is in Lake Ontario Hall for the remainder of the school year. The Plast Nation Lab not only offers its services to GVSU's art exhibit, but also aids other institutions around the world with their eerie organisms. We've also plastinated uh, things for a uh, veterinary school in Grenada and a research group that was studying swine ileitis. A reason others around the world rely on this lab may be because of the lack of plastination labs. Although plastination is a useful tool for health and science, GVSU's is the only one in Michigan. It takes some work to set up. Um, it definitely needs someone who's going to be involved with it daily and run the lab. Perhaps that is why Strickler has been able to run the lab since 2013. To have a lab, a functional lab that, that works, you need somebody who's dedicated to taking the reins in the lab and, and carrying out things because you basically have things to do every day. I've been in there this morning already for an hour and a half doing things. Uh, so there are things that have to be done on an ongoing basis. Strickler says many institutions aren't willing to commit to the maintenance of a lab. Along with this, labs can be expensive to set up. But Strickler says it's not as expensive to set up as some believe. There's a rumor out there that it costs hundreds of thousands of dollars to set one up, but in reality it doesn't. And we had uh, vacuum tanks and things built by local um, manufacturing firms that did an awesome job for us and it was cheap. Along with this, the lab recycles its chemicals, saving money that would otherwise be spent to buy more chemicals. Strickler says that if people knew that it doesn't take a lot of money to build and maintain a lab, there'd be more and that there should be more labs because these specimens are very useful for science. In Allendale, I'm Christopher Cooper. The Grand Rapids Public Museum will be hosting the Bodies Revealed exhibit this fall. If you don't want to wait until November to see some plastinated parts for yourself, Grand Valley's plastination exhibit will be up in the Red Wall Gallery in Lake Ontario Hall until June. Go check it out, if you dare. While the up and down temperatures this winter have been frustrating for people living in West Michigan, it's perfect for those who make maple syrup. Kendra Jarzma has more. So far this year, we've had two and a half weeks of warm weather every day, above 32, not a lot of wind, and it freezes every night. So it's perfect for perfect season so far. Making maple syrup takes a lot of work, but this year's weather is almost perfect for it. Bill Martinez has been making maple syrup since the early 1990s and does it just for the love of making maple syrup and sharing it with friends and family. He learned from a neighbor who pointed out that Martinez had a lot of maple trees on his property. When our kids were small, we'd take them over there and gather sap and sit by the fire. And, and so it kind of stuck to us. To make maple syrup, sap needs to be harvested from maple trees. Martinez uses a drill he inherited from his grandfather to put about 150 taps total in his 85 trees. Once the tap is in the tree, a bag is hung on the end of the spout. The sap drips into the bag until it can be collected. The average flow of sap is about one drip per second. But this year, with the warmer days and colder nights, his trees are flowing much faster than average. Warm temperatures are essential for a good flow. Uh, they stop dripping in, in the evening. It gets about 32 degrees, they will shut off. Once the sap is collected, it is pumped inside his sugar shack to begin boiling down. Every year, groups who visit Martinez's setup get to sign the board inside the shack. When the first fire of the year is lit, a new season begins. When we light the first fire, around March 1 to 10, depending on the season, uh, then no matter how much snow is on the ground, winter is over. And so you get to play with fire for about a whole month. Um, the taps last oh, from three to four weeks, and then they finally uh, dry up, either from the season or from the natural bacteria that the tree produces. The sap is only 2% sugar, and since syrup is defined as being 66 and 2 thirds percent sugar, it takes a lot of sap to make one gallon of maple syrup. The average is 40 gallons to one. This year it's probably closer to 30, and it can be as high as 60, and every year different. Once the liquid is done in the sugar shack, it gets moved by hand outside where it is boiled down some more and impurities on the surface are removed. 
When making maple syrup, the temperature has to be fairly precise to create the right consistency. Boils at 219 degrees. If you want to make fudge, that sort of thing, it's uh, 242 degrees, I believe. And hard crack, like a root beer barrel, is uh, 270. So we like to can it when we're finally bottling it, putting it in mason jars. Uh, we like to have it uh, anywhere from uh, 195 on up to that 219. So we like to keep it very hot. When the syrup is ready, it is put through a filter to prevent any more particulates from getting into the finished product. Martina said that sugar sand, a tree particulate in the sap, is heavy this year, and it is crucial to filter that out. This slows down filtering and bottling the syrup. Even with the extra time needed this year, syrup production has been going well for Martinez. Uh, so far this year, and it's really early in the season, uh, we have finished off 23 and a half gallons, which is very high. Other years, we've had our first fire on this date. So it uh, just depends on the season. In West Olive, I'm Kendra Jarsma. Now that temperatures are starting to rise above freezing at night, the trees will likely shut off their sap flow. And that means the maple syrup season is just about over. WGBU Digital Studio Series Order Up just came out with a new segment. Let's take a look at a juice bar in the downtown market and how they're trying to create a healthy community. First of all, let's talk about the origin of the name of Malamaya, mm -hmm. the juice bar here. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, it's a combination of our kids' name, Malachi, Nehemiah, and Josiah. So we kind of put them all together, and it was really a joke when we talked about it. It was kind of funny, like, oh, that's tropical, that's pretty cool. And it's like, wait, that's tropical. Let's go with that. And also for us, we think about the things that we do, like are we leaving a legacy? What kind of legacy are we creating? And we feel like putting our kids' names in it, that's a legacy within itself, something that they can be proud of, and they are. Okay, wonderful. So tell me about the beginnings of the juice bar. You were here at Downtown Market when it opened. Yep. Uh, so that would have been 2013 yes. you've been here. So what is the basis? Why did you want to do a juice bar? As we started talking about a business, we thought about um, really how we could help, I guess, um, cure, if you will, or reduce the health disparities in the black community. So that was really the, the, the start of that, is how do we do that? And we felt like having a juice and a smoothie as a product would be able to do that. Later on, we discovered that that's a huge lofty goal. And so now what we do is we partner with organizations that seek to do that, not just in the, um, the African-American community, but in the communities across the state. Have you been successful in doing that and, and reaching people to get the idea of juicing a, a Yes, product? oh my goodness, yeah, we've seen our clientele. We've seen people who I know personally who would never drink anything green. They might not even wear anything green for all I know, but now they're coming in here getting the greenest juice, getting a wheatgrass shot, getting a green smoothie and bringing friends. Uh, we have folks calling us with certain things that they're dealing with, whether it's, um, whether it's a headache, um, whether it's um, you know a, a certain thing that they notice in their body, and we're able to talk about what kind of juice or smoothie or just fruit might help them, um, I guess, feel better, not necessarily cure something, but just to, to be able to, to, to deal with it and to feel better. Um, and you know, with the internet being here, too, we can always look things up pretty quickly and put together a combination that'll knock something out. So you customize, if you yeah. will, yep. if you want to. So there are a lot of health benefits, and, and many people have already uh, talked about that, but a lot of health benefits to juicing, sure, to yeah. smoothies, and, you, you, and you've seen those in your customers. Yes, yes. I mean, we have one juice called the in-laws. Can you guess what that's for? What is that it's, for? It's good for headaches. <laughs> uh, it's good for headaches. Um, and it's the combination of the, the grapefruit and the beets that helps uh, with the headache. Uh, we have these things called booster shots, and the, the most popular one is the combo. It's lemon, honey, ginger, garlic, and cayenne. And it's a two ounce shot, and people take that if they're sick, or if they're getting sick uh, with a cold, and it would take care of the congestion in the nasal cavity and also in the chest cavity because of all the nutrition that it uh, packs. And it's, it's that time, so it's, that's a good thing to know for those yeah. shots, and that can give you a little boost. And you guys, you, you take your pulp, you, Compost tourists. Yeah, you know, we compost you. it and we work with um, folk all around uh, the, the county. They'll come down here, they might get a bucket full. Right now, we're actually working on um, um, uh, a partnership with Wormies, an um, organization that does composting here in town. And they're, they're picking up compost at home and they're um, just making some really, really great um, soil. Mm -hmm. uh, we work with New Soil right now also, um, and many others in the downtown market do as well. And they take this and they turn it into backfill. We've helped local urban farmers with getting their dirt ready uh, for 
producing fruits and vegetables on there. If they had a, a soil that may have been tainted with lead or something like that, using the, the pulp that we have mm -hmm. with so much nutrition still left in there, it actually helps to essentially heal the earth, heal the ground. And so it's just a, it's, it's a cycle, you know, this, these things come from the ground and now we'll use them, get what we need, and then we're giving them back to the ground as opposed to discarding them and throwing them away. Thank you to WGBU Digital Studios for that segment. That's all the time we have for today. I'm Mackenzie Sorrell. And I'm Savannah Brustman. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next week. West Side Stories is produced by students from the Multimedia Journalism Program at Grand Valley State University. Support also comes from the School of Communications. Inspiring thought, perfecting practice.